Welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Thiessen. With me today is our own pianist in residence, Sam Page. This is your Daily Dose of Happy. We are so happy you decided to join us today. Our friend Jennifer Rurka has a hot, hot, hot business opportunity that came up at the last second, so she won't be joining us this week, but I'm sure she'll be here next week to tell us what exciting things happened during that little uh, interlude she's going to have. Uh, but Sam's here, and, and Sam, we were talking before, you, you're going to prepare something for us next week, right? You're gonna We're going to hear something? Oh, you know it, yeah, and it'll probably be improvised, but it'll give me a little time to try some things out and never know what'll come out, but it'll be a good time. Also wishing Jennifer best of luck with her opportunity. I look forward to hearing about it. Yeah, me too. And and what do you mean? Probably. Uh, do you ever do anything but improvisation? Let's be honest here. I uh, pretty much know. I, I, I did <laughs> read music a week or so ago and it was interesting. I just, sometimes I'll do it every once in a while just to make sure I still can, but yeah, yeah kind of keep in touch, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> that is it. That's where I'm at right what, now. What, I never asked you this. When, when you do uh, somebody else's work, read sheet music or whatever, um, do you have particular you know, favorite composers, songwriters? I mean, what, what do you tend to like to play if it's somebody else's? I used to back back when I was taking piano lessons. I always favored like the more romantic era, like Chopin and oh, um, yeah. Schumann, Schubert. But I also like the impressionist, like Debussy. Um, what I was playing the other day actually was Rachmaninoff. Sometime later in my piano studies, I tried to tackle that. I'm like, okay, I don't know if this is quite in my technical capabilities at once. Rachmaninoff is tough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's tough for anybody. I don't care what your skill level is. Right, right. It was tough for Rachmaninoff to play. That's how tough it was. Probably. <laughs> it was fun to try, though. I, I like your choices, though. I love Chopin. I love uh, oh, yeah. De- Debussy. I love um, Schubert, Schumann. I, th- I love all of those. Those guys are great. Totally. Yeah, yeah no, I... Very good. Although I, I, I once got a pronunciation lesson many, many years ago when I was in my twenties, I, I worked as a bank teller and oh, okay. oh. the teller who sat next to me, I'd be in conversation with her all the time. She was a um, young looking, but older woman who was originally from, let's see, where was she from? She was either from Poland or Ukraine. I can't remember which one. Oh, okay. She had oh. both blood. Oh. Um, and I mentioned we were talking about uh, composers, and I mentioned that I like Chopin. And she uh, said, "Who's Chopin? I don't recognize that." And so I spelled it out for her, and she says, "Oh, Chopin!" <laughs> and like, wow. what do you mean, Chopin? <laughs> so apparently, that's the correct pronunciation thought. of his name, Chopin. But I, wow. I never knew that. <laughs> I've already learned something in this episode. I love it. Me too. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I'm hoping you learn something new. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Oh, we have a special guest joining us. Her name is uh, Bridget Belden, and uh, Bridget has a very interesting message that I, that resonates with me because she's all about finding your passion. Now, in her case, she's particularly oriented toward women, particularly moms, um, who find that you know being a mom is, is certainly very fulfilling, but that, that she needed something extra. Um, but I, I'll let her tell her own story. But I, I just found that fascinating that, that she was looking for passion. Cause for me, that, that was an issue for me for many years. I know it's an issue for many people, many listeners. Uh, and, and sometimes it's a challenge to find it. So first of all, Bridget, welcome to the program. And second, well, how did you find it? Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And I'm excited to dive into the conversation. Um, I found you through Podmatch. Actually, that's true. Yeah, that's true. But but, but how'd you find passion though? Because I, I mean, that, passion. <laughs> pa- passion is the hard one. Is I found. Oh, that <laughs> is um, that is a long answer to a short question. Um, seemingly, deceiving. we'll take a few minutes. Do your best. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can share my story, which kind of yeah. uh, leads through that, if that's helpful. Perfect. So when I was a young woman, I was very very focused on my visualizing my perfect life. I went to a good school and I got a good job and I met and married my handsome husband and we had two kids. I had a boy and a girl. It's perfect, right? <laughs> and I found myself as my kids were younger, you know, from the outside, we looked like any other young family. We were doing sleepovers and soccer games and all of that fun stuff. But on the inside, I felt like I was crumbling. And the reason was I was looking at my life and I loved my family so much, of course. And but inside, there was something missing for me. I didn't know 
what I was passionate about. I didn't know what I, what my purpose was beyond being a mom. I didn't know why I was here really. And, Mm -hmm. um, that haunted me and I kept shoving it to the back of my brain and, you know, back of my head and didn't have time. I was too busy taking care of and doing for and Mm -hmm. doing the things that young moms do until finally it would not be ignored anymore. And, um, I, it, it really was a process for me. And, you know, my husband and I were having a hard time because I couldn't express what was happening to me. Um, I really felt motivated by the fact that I didn't want to wake up one day, look at him and say, who are you and where have I been for the past 20 years? Mm. Um, he was completely confused about what was happening as was I, we were in therapy, nothing was working. Um, long and the short of it was, uh, I was driving home from work one day and in the midst of all of this and this question popped into my head and it said, if I were to die tomorrow, would I have regrets? Mm -hmm. And the answer came back. Yes. And I knew I had to do something. And so my kids were still really little. The only thing I knew how to do was I've got to figure out who I am, what's important to me. And so I just sat down, I got up before they woke up in the morning and I sat down and I just, with a piece of paper and a pen, (laughs) and I just started writing. And it took me, you know, of course, the first couple of times I was like, I don't know, like completely blank slate as to what was passionate. Mm -hmm. Then as I got into more of a habit of it and spent some time and I didn't give up because I knew what was at stake, things started popping up into my, into my mind when I would think about what is it that sparks joy for me? What is it that makes me emotional? What is it that, and I started getting really, really curious about those things. And I started paying attention to those things and noticing them when they were happening in my day-to-day life. So for example, if a news story came on about um, the homeless situation and you know, a child who had made a difference by selling something to donate to a local shelter, that moved me. And so over the course of time, a story started, a picture started to emerge. And what I realized is that I was really, really inspired by kids who made a difference in their community. And so I found myself gravitating to those stories. And a big part of that was because I didn't currently at that time have any real altruistic or charitable outlooks, right? Other than, you know, volunteering at my kid's school. And I felt like that would help guide me there. Anyway, long and the short of it was over a period of months, I developed this picture of what I wanted and kept pulling the threads and getting curious. And I ended up starting a nonprofit called Ripple Kids. And the mission was to inspire and empower kids to make a difference in the community. And I quit my job and was, you know, fortunate enough to be able to do that. Um, spent the time working side by side with my kids who were, you know, we worked with kids who were seven to 12 years old. So my kids were right in there. They would get up with me and do events. And my husband was involved and I had never felt that much passion or purpose in my life mm. um, up until that point. And so that was really, it was a real, it was a process. And I had nobody to guide me. So it took a long time. Well, I noticed that in in your description, you talked about how you developed the habit. I mean, you start off by talking about how one morning you sat down to write down. But when I heard the word habit, I said, okay, this didn't just happen in one day. This happened over a period of, it sounds like months. It took a long time to work this out. Honestly, it's a little bit blurry to me. And, you know, I think, I mean, if the... I didn't have any, I was so ashamed of what I was going through. I didn't want to talk Mm. to anybody about it. So I didn't have, I thought there was something wrong with me. Like, how could I possibly have created this beautiful life and not be happy? Like there's something wrong with me. Oh yeah. And so that kept me isolated. It kept me, um, just really the shame was just so prevalent there. And, you know, back then this was 20 plus years ago, we didn't talk about you know, therapy. It wasn't something, it wasn't like it is today where, you know, you can just talk about it and talk to people about how you're feeling and, um, you know, share those stories. I was just really embarrassed by it. And so, um, yes, it did take, and it's all kind of blurry, um, but it did take a, a long time. It was not, it was not easy at all. And I had nobody to guide me. So that was, so anytime I would come up against those, well, that's stupid. You can't possibly start a nonprofit. I then, 
oh yeah, you're right. It's that, you know, the limiting beliefs and the stories we tell ourselves that would all serve to stop me. And so that would take longer for me to get, you know, over that hump. I think we can all resonate to that because anybody who has ever tried to identify what their passion is goes through something very, very similar. Absolutely. I, I find it interesting. We, we, through our, our normal social structures, our schooling system and our business system and so forth, it, it seems like passion just kind of doesn't get introduced as part of the, part of the curriculum, so to speak. No. Which is, which is kind of a sad thing because it's no wonder that so many of us don't really know what it is. I, I, I'm always amazed whenever we have somebody who's on the show who discovered their passion early and I say, wow, good for you. That is so cool. Cause I know how rare it is. That it is rare. And I think, I think a lot of people along with passion and purpose feel like there, there's this heaviness and weightiness to it. Mm. And when I talk to my clients about purpose, they think, Oh my God, well, you started a nonprofit. You know, I, I have to do something big. I have to end <laughs> or I have to, and that's not it at all. It really is. And I, I think sometimes just the term finding your passion, it's, it feels a little cliche, you know, it feels a little bit, um, it's cliche, but at the same time, it's, it's like riddled with complication in terms of what we think it means. I think we overcomplicate it, um, as we are, you know, people are known to do, but it really is that's that whatever that is, as I define it, it's that thing that speaks to your heart that when you hear about it or you read about it or you see it, it just lights you up inside. And part of the challenge with working with moms and the reason why moms get so separated from it is because we are so focused on everybody else that, you know, just that exercise of me sitting down and focusing on myself was really uncomfortable. It felt like I was exercising a new muscle. And I see that a lot with the moms that I work with. We're not used to considering those things or paying attention. We don't know what lights us up because we're not listening. You know, we're not paying attention to it. That's true. In fact, uh, what you're describing quite beautifully, I think, is how, in in this case, you're talking about it in terms of moms with the perfect family, the perfect, everything's ideal, but it's all external and it doesn't satisfy. Yes. And it isn't until we go internal, doesn't matter what our circumstances are, makes absolutely no difference what our circumstances are. Until we go internal, we never find any of that joy, which is really an interesting thing. And, And it, like you say, you can, it's possible to beat people to it all the time. It's possible to beat yourself up over, well, I've got a perfect life. How could I be, what, what right do I have to be unhappy? Because right. we frame it, we frame the question in terms of what's going on outside. Right. And I, I did such an amazing job. I and mean, I still consider like the vision boards, you know, it's like I literally had everything I set out to do, but then mm-hmm. it was like, now what? And you're right. It's it. That is the distinction is that it was the things and the people. It wasn't the feeling. I never thought about yeah. how I wanted it to feel. Like, do I want to feel love and joy and connection and peace and fulfillment and all of those things? And that didn't enter into the equation. It's reminding me. We um, I, I recently started a meetup.com group. And the purpose of the group is just to help people to feel better about what's going on in their life. So we have, we're going to be doing a, a series of exercises and games and so forth for, toward that purpose. And we had our first, um, really, it, it was our second meeting, but, um, the first meeting didn't really have anybody turn off but me. So it was really our first meeting and, uh, had about a half dozen people and I was leading them through this exercise. It was an exercise of basically trying to imagine what happens if you have more and more money coming in and, you know, playing out spending it. And toward the last few rounds of, of our little game we were playing, I was asking people to do, to, you know, play the game, but then also say, you know, what are you feeling as you're, as you're playing this game? It was really interesting to watch people struggle coming up with words to describe how they were feeling. They could describe what they were doing. They, were, they could describe what they wanted, but they had trouble describing what it was they were feeling about it. And I mean, it didn't surprise me because I, well, I've done the same thing. I think most of us have done the same thing, but when you notice it consciously, it kind of jumps out at you. Yeah. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Brene Brown. Oh, yes. Yeah. (laughs) She's one of my favorites all time, all the way around, but she wrote this. Did you get her book or look at her book, Atlas of the Heart? A a long time ago, but yes. Okay. So she, she talks about, this is her most recent one. She talks about how 
there. Oh, this is the recent uh, one. No, I haven't seen the recent one. The, okay, the, so the recent the, one is. And the, the one that had the, the four things, I can't remember what it's called, but yes, that's the one that I saw. Okay, okay, yes, she's written quite a few. But this one talks about how our language is, we're unequipped to deal with our emotions because when she surveyed and did research and asked people, you know, how many different emotions they knew, the average, I think, was two or three. Mm-hmm. It was like anger, fear, happiness. And mm-hmm. she said, and honestly, I should, I'm not sure, but there's like over 26 or 27 or more different emotions. And she, her, her premise was that if we can't articulate how we're feeling, then we're going to have a really hard time, you know, relating to each other because the emotions are more than just three. <laughs> so you might say you're, you're upset, but really, why are you upset? You know, what's at the heart of it? Are you feeling disappointed? Are you feeling, you know, um, left out? Are you feeling? And so until you can really kind of pinpoint that. So that's just an aside that when you said that, it made, made a lot of sense. Mm, yeah. yeah. It's funny that these, these, um, insights, they, they come at us in a variety of different ways. I mean, I can just see from Sam's expression. <laughs> He's just telling yeah, me just the way he's looking. Yeah, I really interesting because <laughs> I think a lot of people have trouble describing what they feel, myself included sometimes. And I think I, I never considered that it was like lack of proper verbiage to uh, assign to eat all of the broad spectrum of emotions. And I think, yeah, when you th- think about like asking yourself why you feel that way, you can eventually get there. Like, I, Oh, I'm sad. But it's like, why am I sad? And yeah, yeah. Well, I'm disappointed. And yada, yada. like, you can kind of get there, but yeah, it would be nice to have some more, just a wider breadth of um, vocabulary to describe the <laughs> different range of emotions also. Yeah, and you bring up a good point because a big part of this work and and that I think it why it makes it so difficult for people is because it takes that getting curious. It takes asking mm-hmm. those questions. And a lot of people don't do that, whether they're not conscious of the fact that it's it can help them get to the bottom of it or that they're kind of afraid of what they might find or it feels uncomfortable, so they kind of just push it away. But the curiosity is critical in any kind of personal growth work. Absolutely. That was actually something else I kind of noticed when you were telling your story that at a couple of different points, you were asking yourself what I consider very good questions. And that's great. Like, I think that's what we have to do. So I really like appreciate that. Like, I think when you said, like, if I were to die today, would I be happy? And that's like a great kind of springboard into getting more clarity and also like asking, oh, does this spark joy? And like, or what sparks joy? Like, that's, that's, that all really resonated with me, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, good. Yeah, that's really good. I, I was also thinking too, the, what you're talking about there, when you mentioned curiosity, you've mentioned that word a, a few times now. Uh, uh, there's a phrase that came out of the uh, Ted Lasso TV series, be curious, not judgmental. Mm-hmm. And that, that really dis- it, it lays out the distinction very nicely because we do have a tendency to become judgmental. I mean, in, in a sense, you were kind of being judgmental about your own life when you were saying, oh, well, I, I should have it all at this point. What's wrong with me? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's a big part of what's happening in our world today is that there's a lot of judgment going mm-hmm. on about, you know, what's right or wrong or good or bad. And it's mm-hmm. not like, well, why do you feel that way? And, and, you know, getting to the crux and the heart of what kind of that common thread that we all really want the same things. Right. <laughs> and, and it's not like we, we don't have any reason to feel judgmental. I mean, that very, there are times when it's very understandable why we would feel judgmental. I think the right. real question is, is that the way we want to continue to look at whatever it is? Right. I know that I can think of something going on right now in my life that I really can't go into for reasons I can't go into, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I can, I can easily see how I've been looking at it judgmentally and trying to shift myself into being curious about it. Yes. And when you're in the midst, especially if it has strong emotional stuff going on, which this does, that's challenging. Very challenging. Very it's challenging. really tough. And yeah. just putting that challenge out there for yourself shows mm-hmm. a tremendous amount of insight and ability to um, look at that. So even though it's hard to do, keep doing it because, that's, oh, yeah. you know, it's, it's, I think just noticing and witnessing and, um, observing without judgment what's happening and it's it, like you said it's, it can be difficult to do um it's a really good habit to get into it's a good practice 
Yeah, I agree. Well, that's part of the benefit of having done a podcast for 10 years. You pick things up and you start saying, okay, I got to apply this one too. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of information. Yeah. Well, information and perspectives too. That's one yes. of my favorite things to talk about. Oh yeah. When you, when you get all those different perspectives from so many different people, it, it kind of stretches your imagination. Yeah. Cause you have to start t- considering things that you never really considered before. And very yes. often there's a gift in there too, which is pretty cool. Absolutely. Yeah. When you're, when you're working with your, uh, client, now you're a life coach, right? I mean, you, yes, you work with, you work primarily with moms, I'm gathering. Primarily with moms, yes. Right. Yeah. So when, so when you're working with your moms, um, I imagine this kind of comes up fairly regularly. There's, you know, the, the, it's part of the exploration process, right? Yes. Yes. That part that, um, you know, and it's funny because that my clients are on a continuum. You have some that, you know, um, know what they want to do. They're just not sure how to get there and they need support there. But in getting to there, it's a lot of dispelling the stories that we tell ourselves going through, you know, the negative beliefs that we've, we picked up along the way. I mean, it's, it's remarkable the consistencies, no matter where they are on the continuum. And I think this is probably true of everybody, right? That those same things keep coming up and those oh, are yeah. the things that serve to get in our way. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. It's really rewarding too. It's also annoying. I mean, to be perfectly <laughs> honest. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I have to deal with this again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It never goes away. And it's funny because I mean, I've been doing this work for 25 plus years and you know, it's never done. You're never mm. done. You're never done working on yourself, right? There's always something new to learn, which makes it fascinating. It can also make it when you're saying, oh my God, I'm going through this again. Like this is, mm. the I'm ready to be done with this. Um, you know, it's, it, it is, it's human nature is uh, interesting. <laughs> There's also for me, uh, and, and again, I'm, I'm really reflecting off of what I've been going through lately. The, the, there's a larger story that the audience knows about that I can tell you that um, I'm going through a separation divorce situation right now. And there's been a whole bunch of other stuff that's gone along with that. Awesome. So when, when you, when you have a whole bunch of, of life upset going on at one time, uh, it, it, it's fairly overwhelming and you, you pretty much, you kind of have to sit back and just say, okay, I'm going to wait for all the plates to settle down. Cause I can't keep up with all those spinning plates. It's not yeah. possible. Yeah. But even in the midst of that, every once in a while you get thrown another curveball. Well, I mean, it, like that wasn't enough, you know, because right. cause literally this upset my, my primary relationship, it upset my career, it upset uh, my living situation. It upset, I mean, literally everything was falling apart. Everything right. was being thrown in, into chaos and, and I was trying to make sense out of it. And then in the midst of doing all that and dealing well with all that, another curveball comes along. You say, what, I don't have enough yet? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When did the curveball stop coming in here? Yeah. Well, and, you know, there's a couple ways you could approach it. One is, I mean, when you're in the midst of something like that, and I'm sorry, because it's not easy to go through all of that at once, you know, there's there's kind of two options. One is um, most likely in a situation where you are, it's white knuckling it, right? You're just going, okay, I'm holding on for dear life. Kind of. Do the best I can, you know, treat yourself with compassion and grace and give yourself the space to figure it out. And then as the plates start to settle, the reflection point of, and I'm sure you already do this, is like, okay, why is this happening for me? How is this happening for me? What am I to learn? What am I being shown? And that can be really, really hard when you're in the midst of all of it. But as you start to, you know, come through it, sometimes for me, I find that those are the moments that I get the most insight into what I have yet to learn and that it helps the healing process, looking at it that way rather than, you know, kind of, oh, my God, why is this happening to me? You know? Yeah. I, I Well, I would say that for me, the way I've kind of turned it into, what I've kind of turned it into is I'm, I'm pretty much past the white knuckle stage. I'm more yeah. into, okay, so what's the next one that's going to come down? Yeah. Oh, that's the next one. Okay. Well, so what's the next one? Just kind of, it's almost like being an observer of your own life saying, well, okay, this is interesting. Wonder what, you know, what's the next chapter in this serial of sense and sensibility or whatever, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which, you know, in a way is curiosity in and of itself. You it know? is. Yeah. 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 Definitely. And in the process of, of doing all that, I, I kind of liken it to gaining perspective on your own life. Oh, for sure. Yeah. 
because when you can get, when you can kind of look at your own life from not far away but a, a more more distant more objective yeah more distant perspective than oh my god i'm in the midst of you know trying to save my life it it just feels different uh-huh. if, if you i mean actually to be honest it, it isn't so much right now dealing with the chaos it's more like dealing with the boredom in between like okay so when's the next one going to happen <laughs> yeah. yeah and i think that expectation you know while it's very tempting can also be a trap you know, sure. expecting the next thing that's going to come along, but it's going to be bad, you know, that something really crappy is going to happen to me. Um, but clearly when, like I said, when you're, when you're kind of, you know, juggling all the plates, that's what it feels like, certainly. Right. Yeah. Well, also, I don't know, it, it isn't just a question of what's the next thing that's going to happen that's bad. It's also been for me, what's the next thing that's going to happen that's going to be good or good. to put it another yeah. way. A lot of the time now, I'm just, I'm, I'm watching how things are playing out and there's not really a good or a bad attached to it. Yeah. It's more, it's more like, well, this is interesting. (laughs) Which that's, that's amazing that you can detach from that because if you think about how the, and, and how the emotion can cloud, you know, your reaction, um, your responses. Um, how you're acting, who you're being, and they can do far more damage sure. by being overly emotional than by looking at it objectively and going, okay, hmm. <laughs> you know, kind of that removal of, of those so that you can respond rather than react. Yes. Um, yeah. Cause those responses are really key. Yes. Um, cause, cause you have so many, when you're, when you're going through a, a chaotic time, like I am right now, the responses really play two major roles. The first major role is they help or harm either way, depending on which way I respond. They have, let's put it this way. They affect what my next experience is going to be. There's like a direct cause and effect. In addition to that, how I'm responding is also creating vibrationally, I guess you could say what is going to happen, Mm -hmm. not just how am I going to react to it, but how is stuff going to play out? Mm-hmm. So, so you got both factors going on at the same time. It's affecting how, you know, what I'm attracting to my life. And it's also affecting how I'm going to feel the next time something happens. Yes, totally. Yeah. I think that's where a lot of the confusion comes in, to be honest. Hmm. Because when, when you're in the midst of, of waiting for stuff to play out, I, I know a big part for me has, has become, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, impatience, impatience. Uh-huh. Like, when is this going to finally conclude? Yes. Yeah. And I can see it playing out. I mean, it's not like there's, it's not like most of it's hidden from me. I can see it playing out, but there's a part of me that's like, come on, come on, come on. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> this has been going on long enough now. <laughs> and that's where the trust comes in, right? Yeah. That, that, and, and that's my word of this year. Um, trust. so it's very okay. timely for me. Yeah. It's trust because. I too, you know, maybe it's good, maybe it's bad. Maybe I'm just looking, okay, what's coming in next for me? And you want to hurry it up, but then trusting that, that the process is going to work the way the mm-hmm. process is going to work and it's happening for a reason. And so when I find myself getting impatient or anxious, particularly around like around my kids, um, I, I remind myself, I just say to myself, trust, trust. And that helps me reel it back in and get centered again. <laughs> That's good. That's really good. Yeah. Because that trust is is really that's the core of it. That's the yeah. core of it. Yeah. yeah. And that's where all the lessons are too. Absolutely. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, transformation is really um painful, but you'll come out the other side and be like, Wow. <laughs> yes. I, I look at my, you know, what I went through, um, because there was a por- period of time I actually moved out of my house and filed for divorce. You know, mm. I did include that part of my story because we had weren't able to get to a place where we could see eye to eye and therapy wasn't helping. And he was, you know, holding on tighter and tighter. And I was kind of feeling like I was suffocating. And I said, this is, I'm, I'm bound and determined to figure this out. And I had two small kids living Mm. at home and it was really painful. It still makes me cry when I think about it. Sure. But I knew I had that trust that it was that I, I had to do it. There was no other way. And, um, I, I look at my life, it's really before and after, Mm. 
it's before and after. And I was, I, I look at who I was during that time. Yeah. She, I don't know who she is anymore. I mean, there's elements of her that show up, but I look at her and I just go, wow, <laughs> we needed something big to happen because I was so wound and tight and, you know, control. Like I would just had it all figured out. And mm. that's why it kind of went, no, you don't. The universe mm. just went, <laughs> Yeah. So, um, yeah. And I had to learn how to give up that control. I had to learn how to release that, that fear of what everybody else thought, you know, what will people think? I mean, that was kind of how I lived my life. I had so many, so much attachment to, you know, doing things perfectly. You know, there was a lot of perfectionism in there um, that really didn't, none of it was conducive to living <laughs> a, a full life and joyful life. Right. It really wasn't. Um, so I look at it now and I just go, wow, I am so blessed and I'm so grateful for having gone through that as painful as it was. And we made it through. My husband and I are still together. We celebrate 30 years. Um, Congratulations. Year, actually, that, that's, that's, that's an achievement. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> A big achievement. Yes. Yeah. For everything that happened. So, um, yeah. So I, I, I can test, I can, um, testify that. Um, you will come out of this and you'll look at it and just go, wow, what a gift. Although it doesn't feel like it. Well, it's actually somewhat familiar, to be honest. And I, I've mentioned this before on the podcast, but um, about, let's see, what was it? it? It'll have been eight years ago. No, nine years ago. Nine years ago this month. That's right. Nine years ago this month, um, my wife and I went through another series of just chaotic events. And they all worked out and some of them worked out miraculously. Yeah. And so yeah. as I started going through this series of events, that's the, the first thing that kind of flashed into my mind. Like this feels like nine years ago. Hmm. It, it, I mean, it has the exact same feel to it. And even now, even as I'm still going through it, it has been playing out. I, I mean, things have fallen into place. In fact, talk about um, the universe knowing what's best or God or spirit or whatever, um, no, knowing the better plan. I mean, the timing of how little things have happened has been astonishing. Yeah. Just That's astonishing. Fun. You know, I, I, I won't go into all details, but just kind of descriptively, you know, X happens and then it gets immediately followed by Y that if Y had happened before X, it would have been a catastrophe, but because it happened afterward, it was perfect timing. And that, that got followed by Z, which got followed by A prime, which was the same thing as Y. Uh, it, it's just absolutely perfect. And you, yeah. and I look at it and say, how the hell does that happen? Yeah. But it does. That's kind of fascinating. It, yeah. well, it is. It, it's, I mean, it, 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 we talk about law of attraction have for years on the show. And so, you know, it's not like we don't have any familiarity with it, but when you experience it with that degree of precision, you, you kind of marvel. Mm hmm. Like, Wow, this stuff is just freaking amazing. It's so freaking cool. Yeah, it is. <laughs> that even when you can sit there in the midst of all of that and say, this is so freaking cool, <laughs> even right. though I'm struggling when I'm in pain and everything else, it's, um, yeah, it's pretty. It's, it's like, I'll, I'll be glad when it's over, but wow. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a gift. It's, yeah, it, 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 you, you have so many different emotions, conflicting emotions when yeah. you go through a period like this. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I can imagine. I'm going to turn up my light a little bit for those of you watching. Now, nice. of course, of course, most of us, most of the time, we're not going through chaos and crisis. Most of the time, we're living, you know, just <laughs> normal lives or, or perhaps coming up on something because something's been bothering us. I mean, that's how you get a, a customer. I mean, sometimes you get a customer or a client because they are going through a crisis, but sometimes yeah. they're just trying to figure things out. That. I mean, I feel like these, these different periods ought to have like names, like labels. So we can say this is period X and this is period A, and this is period G and, you know, but we don't have that. So yeah. I'll, I'll just kind of generically describe that, you know, we have these periods where you know, everything seems to be going smooth on the outside, but you can tell things aren't quite working on the inside. I imagine that's where a lot of the, the clients come into you. That's a little bit of a different space than what I've been going through right now and what we've been talking yes. about. Talk about that from the perspective of, of you as a coach and from the perspective of someone going through something like that. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because like I said, the, 
the moms come to me on a variety of reasons. And um, I think everybody goes through that. Aha, something, there's something disconnected here. There's something out of sync mm-hmm. um, at different phases of their life. And I focus on the moms who are entering in the, into the empty nest. Cause that's a phase that is really sure. pivotal. And I feel fortunate that I went through it when I did, when my kids were little, because, and I think in large part so that I could come back and, and now that I'm in the empty nest phase, talk to moms about what it feels like and what it's like and that they're okay. Um, and so a lot of times it really is, there's this sense that, um, you know, what motivates them to, to, to reach out is I'm terrified. I don't know what comes next. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I feel overwhelmed because I feel all this emotion about my kids leaving. Um, and I know it's the way it's supposed to be, but I'm not quite sure what to do with all of this emotion and how am I supposed to process it? Mm -hmm. Um, I have no idea who I am and Mm -hmm. I'm 40 or 50 something years old. And here I am going, now what? Now what? Yeah. <laughs> now what? And so it's a variety of triggers and a variety of responses to those triggers that, that, that cause people to reach out. And I think it takes a tremendous amount of, even though, um, even though in some cases, I mean, there's, like I said, varying levels, but I think it takes a tremendous amount of, um, strength and, um, you know, courage to be able to reach out and go, you know what, something's not right. And I need some support because Mm -hmm. we're also trained to say, Oh, I'll figure it out. Everything's okay. You know, moms always have it, you know, (laughs) mom always has the answers. Um, and to be able to raise your hand and go, I don't, I don't, I'm stuck. I don't know what the answer is. I need some support on this. Takes a, that's a huge first step. Um, so it's, it's a number of, a number of things. I don't know if that answered your question. I think it's a good answer, actually, especially that last bit about uh, moms know, are supposed to know everything or they actually do. Know. In fact, that, that I mentioned the Ted Lasso series. One yes. of the moms in that particular says one of her, her famous comments that she says over and over again to her daughter, who's like one of the lead characters, is, well, I know everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, and then she says something in the very next line that illustrates that she doesn't know everything, which is what makes it really, really comic. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. That's a great show. It's a great show. It is. I love that show. I can't wait yeah. for the next season to come. The third season is going to be really great. Well, actually, the last season is kind of sad, but that's all right. It was. Um, it was. But I think about that, and I realize that that certainly does apply to moms in general. It's going to apply to empty nesters. It's going to apply to a lot of different people because everybody goes through different phases of life. And yes. when you shift from one phase to the next, that's when the questions pop up, right? Yes. And the insecurities the and insecurities, all, you know, yeah. all those, you know, the, the inner critic and the doubter and the, and, you know, I look at my husband is, um, 66 turning 67 in October, you know, so he's approaching, he technically could be retired, but mm-hmm really isn't ready for that yet. And Mm. I consider men heading into retirement at a very similar place as moms heading into empty nester. Mm. Because, you know, for moms, you're used to doing for and taking care of, and that's your role, right? And we put on so many different roles. And so then you strip all that away and you're going, oh my God, I don't know who who I am. And for men, it's the same thing. You know, they're brought up that it's like, you know, you're told at a young age, or at least particularly for his generation, you know, you go to work, you provide, that's what you do. And he's, mm-hmm. he's worked at his same job for 40 years. Wow. Um, and he's done really well, but he's a little bit terrified. I think there's a part of him. And not only does he have these, you know, what am I going to do? What do I like to do? What are my hobbies? Like, how am I going to keep myself busy? Cause he likes to have mm-hmm. stuff doing, but it's also, there's not, it's, it's funny that the mental health, and I think I'm starting to see glimpses of this changing, but there isn't that outreach for men and it's, and, and men, you know, culturally are not supposed to talk about their feelings. Mm-hmm. Right? And so particularly if his generation, so it's like, okay, so we're going to give you this scenario and, that flies in the face of everything you've ever known and then not give you any support <laughs> yeah. deal with it, you know? And um, like I said, I'm starting to see some of that change with some, you know, there are some groups that are working more with men, but um, I think that's a pivotal time for them as well. Yeah. 
And I'm and not to say that empty yeah. nesting for men isn't the same that it is for women. I think there's feelings of loss. I think there's probably kind of that shift in perspective. But I think in traditional or typical households, it's the mom that does most of the, you know, heavy lifting when it comes to running the household and taking care of the kids. And in that case, that's when I think it becomes really challenging. Yeah, I would think so too. I mean, because that's much, a much bigger piece of her life than it is of his life. His life yeah. is, you know, half spent at work and, and yeah. bringing in the money and making sure everything's paid for and all that stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the roles are going to kind of just, they're, they're, they're going to kind of drive the whole thing, I think. Yes. Yeah. But as you point out, that that's that's the, the traditional role. Even those roles are changing. I mean, yes. how the families these days is changing substantially. Yes, the younger generations. Yeah. <laughs> I feel so old when I say that, but yeah. I mean, my my daughter's twenty seven and um, she's not married, but um, you know, I see a lot of my friends' kids that are married and have families, and yeah, those roles are changing, and and I think it's a really good thing. We actually have a representative here because Sam is part of the younger generation. So, so Sam, yes, when, you, Sam. When, you, when you think uh-huh. about the roles and, and, and the male role and all that kind of thing, it's different now. But, but what do you think about? It's definitely changing just because I think humanity keeps on kind of, how do I put it, like expanding their views and everything. But, um, yeah, for me, I'm just single LGBT. Well, not, no, I'm not single, but I'm not married. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting. interesting distinction. I like that one. Yes. I know. Okay. I, like, I'm legally single. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, and everything. And so it, it's, it's very interesting because a lot of, um, yeah, the roles are definitely changing. And I think there's like humanity's moving towards just kind of, uh, breaking free sounds a little dramatic, but for lack of a better term, like breaking free of like sort of the socially constructed ways of society that have kind of served humanity up until this point, I think s- starting to kind of expand ones, like seeing that there are other options there and stuff. So it's kind of interesting to see. And I think there's probably just a lot more variety than any of us would think. Cause yeah. You know, like he's basically, yeah. <laughs> do, do, you, do you feel like, I, can, can you identify how you feel it affects you t- to deal with that space? It doesn't necessarily, well, I, I say it doesn't, but then like I do have some friends who are, who are recent moms, like have, ha- have like zero to two year old children. And so then like that does affect me in the sense that I am not, I'm not able to see them or be in contact with them as I was before they had their children. So yeah, it does, it does affect you in like ways you don't, uh, don't necessarily think of. Hmm. Yeah. That, that's part of this whole transition that the way families are organized, the way that households are organized are so diverse now that it, it, I mean, there was a uniformity to society and that uniformity isn't there anymore. Right. And I think we're still trying to figure out how does that play out? How does that affect everything? Yeah. I mean, look at gender roles. That's a really good, right? Gender. Absolutely. Yeah, that's. I haven't. I haven't even quite caught up with all of that yet. But there's. Oh my gosh. That's like blown that park open within the last, just like within the last five years or so. I feel like. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. And you're probably doing better than, I mean, I'm in my 60s now. I still haven't figured out gender roles. I'm, I'm, I'm closer, but <laughs> I still haven't fully, fully figured it all out yet. Yeah. It's, it's, it's hard. I mean, it's very different for, you know, when you grow up where there is, you know, a certain number and now all of a sudden there's any, you know, almost it feels like infinitesimal. Right. And you have a little little things that make them different. It's very hard for somebody in this brain. I'm speaking of me personally to go, okay, so explain to me again. Cause I want to understand. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I do. It's very, but it's. Yeah, no, I, I get that. Cause it's the same for me. It's a lot to keep up with. And I think people who like identify as something other than like the traditional, like male or female will appreciate as long as you're like trying to understand, I think. Mm-hmm. I do my best. And that's all we can do. <laughs> I made the comment on yesterday's program that um, it's only really in the last 10 years or so that I, for the first time in my life, considered myself to be masculine. Mm. I mean, going through most of your life and you don't even feel like you're masculine and you're male. It's like, oh, yeah. yeah. And, and you know, I, I, I can kind of, I know where that comes from because um, 
I mean, Bridget, you and I, our generation pretty much grew up at a time when all those roles were starting to change. And so right. what we were taught doesn't actually jive with what we experienced. So what do I do about this? I don't know. What is, what is my male role? What is the female role? I don't even know. Nobody seems to have any answers on this stuff. Yeah. 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 So it, it creates a lot of confusion. It does. It creates good. I mean, good stuff's come out of it, but. Well, I guess what that's what happens. Good stuff comes out of confusion. It doesn't come out of everything being in its place. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's for sure. It's the whole transformation conversation, right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. you pick up your life and shake it up. And, you know, this is how I explain it. It's like I feel like I took my life, shook it up and tr- dumped it upside down and then put the pieces back together again. We live in a snow globe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Well, now it all makes sense, of course. How, how, why didn't I know that one before? <laughs> all right, so let's go go back to um, what you were talking about with um, when you're working with your clients, and, and we, we've kind of outlined briefly you know, what what many of the, the customers, when, what many of the clients are dealing with when they come in. But when you work with them, how do you how do you work with them? How do you help them? Give us an idea I of what thought, what the coaching uh, is like. Well, I've got a six month program, and mm-hmm. it really depends on. You know, I meet them where they are. So wherever they are on that continuum. Um, but it's things like um, helping them to, I think, let me say this generally about coaching in general, that I think is probably one of the biggest benefits is that it's somebody to hold you accountable to your own goals mm-hmm. so that you can't, you know, do the double talk kind of mamby pamby, you know, where you can talk yourself into or out of anything, whatever serves you. Cause there's somebody there saying, listen, this is what you said you wanted, but your actions are saying this. So which one is it? And let's figure that out. So there's that. There's also um, somebody really shining a light on um, (laughs) those areas um, and inconsistencies that are really hard to see when you are like I was sitting there doing it by myself. Because When you're sitting there trying to do it by yourself, the only person reference point you have is yourself. That's and it. we know that that can be very um, ch- challenging for a number of people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think those those two pieces are really, really critical with any kind of coaching program. And then it's really um, understanding where they are, um, understanding what they want, helping them go step by step. We meet once a week um, for three weeks, and then we have the fourth week off for integration. And we, it's really dependent, the the client kind of drives that. So for example, you know, I have clients that will, you know, I could have an entire curriculum laid out. And when I first started, I did, I had this whole program, but then quickly realized that that doesn't work um, because, you know, you have some clients who start here on the curriculum. You have some that start here. You have some that never even get to it because Mm -hmm. real life is in session. And Mm -hmm. so having these conversations about stuff that's coming up real time and talking through it. And those are probably the most fascinating and best examples of talking through, you know, well, what, what made you think that? And can you see that maybe that was your, you know, your limiting belief, you know, why do you think you can't do that? Um, You know, who told you that? And why is that even in your, isn't it possible that you can do that? So continually, you know, pushing, um, and expanding those boundaries. Um, and I have a, a I call it a pillar system. Uh, it's called Live Brighter. My, my company is Magenta Consulting. So Living Brighter is uh, <laughs> okay, sure. sitting here in the dark. <laughs> 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 but it uh, the, the whole idea is that these pillars are really what I found in my 20 plus years of doing this work, both on myself and with my clients is that I found these to be kind of the the threads that weave together this tapestry of life. And it's, Mm -hmm. it spells out the word bright. So it's be brave, cultivate relationships, live with intention, practice gratitude, prioritize health and live your truth Mm -hmm. and take them through, you know, kind of assessment and assessment of where, how they think they're doing in each one of those areas with examples. And then just kind of saying, I'm going to pick, living with intention as the pillar I want to focus on. And I'm going to set out three action steps. Um, So it might be, you know, I'm going to every morning, I'm going to get up and I'm going to meditate for 30 minutes a day. And, um, you know, setting very small, actionable goals that I know you're familiar with this term, but it's like that one degree shift Mm -hmm. that can make all the difference over time. 
Yeah. And so it's setting those really actionable, achievable goals so that they can, you know, take these steps. And by the end of the six month program, they kind of look back and we do a reflection. And it's like, who, like I said, who was that person? You know, right. and I think if I had had coaching <laughs> when I was going through what I went through, I probably could have <laughs> moved. I probably could have moved through that entire period within um, six months to a year, but it really took years from the very beginning of that inkling of, you know, question and doubt to where I ended up with a nonprofit. That's so, a substantial difference. Six, you know, six months versus years. That, yeah. that, that's not small. No, it's not small. And it's not to say that your work is done at the end. Right. Of the, the women I work with are not like, okay, Check that one off my list. <laughs> complete. As you know, you're talking about this, you know, another round of transformation because, you know, life is, is not static. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we continue to grow and learn and things change around us and what we want changes. And so we evolve and it's um, like, you know, after doing this for as many years as I have, I'm having some of my biggest breakthroughs now learning about myself. You know, where I guess I'm like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I had no idea. Mm-hmm. I had no idea I thought that. I had no idea that was impacting me this way. Really interesting. And I'm also. It, 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 it's bringing to my, I mentioned there's this thing going on that I can't talk about and I still can't talk about it. Uh, but it, it, largely because it isn't actually directly uh, affecting me. It's indirect. It's very indirect, oh, but it, it's, exactly. it's significant. Um, but. Even as I look at that particular event, I say to myself, I, I am continuing to be amazed at all the different ways that life refocuses my attention, even when I don't want it to. Mm-hmm. And it's an example of you know, this, this thing I'm going through is an example of that. Mm-hmm. But not only is it uh, uh, how life is refocusing myself in ways I didn't really want to refocus myself, it's also about how am I navigating my life or am I navigating my life? I mean, the, the, a key piece of the other factors that are involved that I can't go into is there are people involved who really weren't doing a whole lot of growing as far as I know. Mm-hmm. And it's funny how life just kind of catches you up anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you can try to be in that non-growth space. You can kind of, you know, make everything well, like what you were describing that you did when you were in your twenties and you had your young family and so forth. You tried to frame it into this nice, tight, little, perfect world, you know, 2.4 kids and the Volvo and all that kind of stuff. But life catches up anyway. Yeah. The universe has this amazing ability to just go, uh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Right. This is what you're supposed to be doing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I think the people that um, have the most fulfilling lives are the ones that choose to pay attention to that. Yes. And, and in any way they can, you know, it might take a crisis like I had, mm-hmm. right. Um, or what you're going through or what you've mm-hmm. been, through, or what anybody I'm sure has had. It's all relative, right. We've all gone through these things. But um, yeah, it's, I think in looking at it that way, it really, um, A, calls into that, to play that whole trust factor that you trust that whatever's happening is meant for your highest good. And what can I learn from this? Um, And B, it kind of makes it a game. When you talk, when you're describing okay, what's happening next? And you're saying, you know, you you feel a little bit detached more as an observer and just kind of curious about what's going to happen next. Mm-hmm. That adds a little bit of play into a situation that could be completely opposite if you chose to make it so. As you were saying that, it also occurred to me that while most of what we've been talking about it has to do with what's going on in our own lives and, and how we're responding to what's going on in our own lives. We also have concern about other people, mm-hmm. people who we care about, you know, people who are close to, or maybe even just people more you know, broadly in society at large. And it can be distressing to see what they go through. Yes. You know, whatever right. it might be, I mean, there are all different kinds of stresses and, and stressors and de-stress, you know, stuff that causes de-stress. 
uh, distress, I should say. Um, but one of the challenges that goes along with that is, again, this is coming back to our own stuff that we're going through. How are we going to respond to all that? Because those responses still impact us. Oh, yeah. And, and you're, okay, I don't know if you're a parent, but this is a constant challenge for parents, particularly mm-hmm. parents of, I've found, of, of adult children, 27, mm-hmm. 25 I have now, where as they're adults and you're thinking, okay, you know, when you look at that phase from when they're younger, you're going, okay, if I can just get them through college, we'll be <laughs> Let me tell you, <laughs> it was nothing when they were little. It was like they'd sit, they'd listen, they'd do what you tell them to do. Maybe they'd have a little tantrum or whatever, but you had control over it, right? Now it's oh, yeah. like to, to get back to your point about how you respond or react, you know, as a parent, your job is to get them ready for success, whatever that looks like. And when they don't meet that, you feel a tremendous amount of responsibility and you also feel a tremendous amount of weight and wanting to make it right. Hence the helicopter parenting, all of that stuff. And I currently am um, experiencing that in my own life where it's just like that release of control. And that's why trust is such a big part of my, um, is, is my word for 2023 is because we can't control what other people, how they experience and, right. and they are learning on their journey, just like we are. That's their journey. Yeah. But I think when you introduce a parent into that type of scenario of their own children, it makes it really, really complicated and really, really hard to watch your kids struggle. And even if you know it's for their highest good, you just want to go do it this way. <laughs> Let me do it for you. You know, Let me do it for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like trying releasing is really hard, mm. really hard. And, and not just releasing, but this is the hardest part. I think being okay with the fact that they're going down a path that you just see where it's going to crash. Yeah. Yeah. That's tough. That's just plain tough. It's very hard. Yeah. Yeah. But if we, like you say, I think you're right. That is the watchword trust. Not just, I would say not just in 2023. I think it's the watchword every year. Yeah. That, that, yeah if general. you can, if mm-hmm. you can trust, what's that, Sam? I just said, I, I definitely agree. <laughs> oh, you agree. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause if you can trust, that's, that's really it. That's the whole deal right there. That's the thing that we're all really trying to learn. Can I trust no matter what's going on that? Yep. It's all going to work out. It's all yeah. going to work out in the end. Yeah. yeah. It's a big trust. Hey, we're running out of time. I want to make sure that I uh, uh, get a couple things in here. So first of all, you got your coaching program and you have some stuff, uh, other stuff going on. And people want to find out about Bridget Bilden. How do they find you? How do they find your coaching? How do they find all that stuff? I think the best source is BridgetBilden.com. From there, you can do my Instagram and Facebook if you're on it. Um, I You can sign up for my newsletter. Not newsletter. It's a, really a Monday mindset email, we call okay. it. Um, that go out every Monday morning and, um, I dig in every month to one of the pillars. So for example, January is all about intention. And so I share stories, my own, you know, experiences, how I dealt with it, try and impart some sort of, um, tips, um, you know, things to think about as you're kind of navigating your own journey, um, and mindset shifts. Uh, so, so that, um, if you, if, if people are interested in learning more about, you know, kind of the pillars and how to integrate them into their lives, they can also just email me if they have questions. Um, and on the website, the other thing is I have, I offer a 45 minute, uh, free complimentary pathway to purpose coaching program, which is basically coaching session, I should say, which is basically one on one where we sit down and talk about the biggest obstacle or challenge that the, the, um, mom or potential client has in, uh, really figuring out what's next mm-hmm. and give a little action plan. And then we can talk about if they're interested working together, what that looks like. If not, they can, there's no obligation can take whatever information they get and go on their way. So um, yeah, there's a few things on there we're working on. on that sounds more. really good. That sounds very good. Actually, you cued in my mind, something I like to always include at the end of all of these conversations with wonderful people like you, because you're, you like so many people, you're a giver and you, and you just keep giving and giving and giving. And as you mentioned, there are the times where you give and it's just not 
going to be something that could be received at that time. That's okay. No big deal. But there are also times like you're doing this podcast, you're, you're reaching out, talking to people that uh, you'll never meet them and you'll never see them, but some of them you're touching their lives and, and you do it with stuff that you write and, and other shows that you appear on. And you know, I don't know if you have a book, but if you have a book out there, it's the same kind of thing. Not there. yet. Not yet. That's coming. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> but, but the point is you're, 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 you're communicating all this information to people and many of them, you'll never meet them. You'll never see them, but you're touching their lives. I think it's important to recognize that. So on behalf of all those people you've never met and you've never seen whom you've been able to help without even knowing it. Thank you. Thank you for what you've been doing. Thank you for um, what you continue to do. Thank you so much for saying that because, um, yeah, it's, it's nice to consider that it makes it feel like, this is worth it. And I get so much joy out of it. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. And thank you, Sam. Thank you. I gotta give you, I gotta give you some credit here because you, you've been kind of evolving over time. You're jumping in now. You're getting, you're saying, okay, I'm going to be a part of this conversation. Yeah. I, go I for it, guy. I figured I need to, I, I could stand to step out a bit more. So. That's beautiful. I love that. Well done. Well done. Oh, thank so, you. Good thank stuff you. happening there. <laughs> and uh, thank you to our podcast listeners everywhere. We will see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody.